Welcome to ECE 595, Statistics 598, or Machine Learning 1. Today we are going to talk about lecture number 37 on robustness and accuracy trade-off. If you recall the past couple lectures, we have been introducing a few adversarial attack methods and also a few adversarial defense methods. There are actually two very interesting fundamental questions about adversarial attack that we have not been able to address. The first question is that whether we will be able to completely avoid adversarial attack. Or in other words, is there any classifier that cannot be attacked at all? So one of the objectives of this lecture is to convince you that Indeed, all classifiers are adversarially vulnerable. The other question that we want to ask is that if adversarial attack is unavoidable, then what can we do? And what I want, what I want to show you today is that there is a natural trade-off between robustness and accuracy. In other words, you will be able to construct a classifier that is absolutely robust, but it may be useless. Or you can find a classifier that is absolutely accurate, but it can be very, very vulnerable. Uh, what we are going to do today is to characterize such trade-off. So here is the plan of this lecture. I will focus on two very recent papers. The first paper is written by Fawcy et al. The title of the paper is Adversarial Vulnerability for Any Classifier. You can find the paper on archive. The other paper is by Dan et al. The title of the paper is Theoretically Principled Trade-Off Between Robustness and Accuracy. You can also find the paper on archive. This lecture is going to be reasonably theoretical However, in order to give you the main picture, I decided not to go into the technical details of each theorem. What I want to do is to highlight the ideas and then try to convince you that these two questions can be answered in the ways that these authors have proposed. Here is the outline of today's lecture. There will be two components. The first component is to talk about the question of adversarial robustness for any classifier. And then the second half of this lecture, we are going to talk about this robustness and accuracy trade-off. So specifically for part one, we are going to answer a few questions. Uh, we are going to ask, can we completely avoid adversarial attack? And is there any classifier that we cannot attack? And what will be the major influencing factor to, uh, to answer these two questions? Okay, so let's first talk about the first part, which is the, whether adversarial robustness uh, can be guaranteed or adversarial attack cannot be avoided by any classifier. So here's the question is, adversarially attack unavoidable. Now, how should we tackle this problem? Uh, this problem is very, very general in the sense that we want to address this problem for any classifier, and therefore any theoretical bounds that we're going to derive has to be universal and is not specific to a, 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 a one of the classifiers. Now, in the literature, I can find two very recent papers that can discuss this problem, and I'm going to briefly discuss uh, both. Uh, we, will go, we, are, we are going to spend most of the time talking about the first paper by Fawcy et al. There is a second paper, which is by uh, Shafahi, which uh, the title is uh, Are Adversarial Examples Inevitable? And you can find the paper on archive. Now, in my opinion, both papers, they are trying to address the question of whether adversarial attack is unavoidable. 
They have different results, but then the claim, they are fairly similar. I want to point out that, in my opinion, their results are general, but at the same time, also restrictive. They are general because they are able to provide you universal bounds for all classifiers. However, they are restrictive because of the way that they assume uh, when proving the theorems. For example, in Fawcett's paper, what is being assumed is that there exists a generative model and that also requires you to have an LP ball attack. In the paper of Shafahi et al., that paper requires you to leverage high dimensional statistics. So here is our plan. We want to understand these papers in a very, very superficial way. We want to understand the major claims and we want to draw some pictures and try to understand what it is about. We are not going to worry about the technical details of how do we prove these results. For example, in Fawcett's paper, it was mentioned that you need to use a technique called the Gaussian isoperimetric inequality in order to show the theorem number one. Uh, we are not going to prove that theorem using the Gaussian isoperimetric inequality. However, we will state the theorem and we are going to understand and interpret what that theorem means. So to start with, let me introduce some notations given by the two papers. Let's assume that you have an input data point X. Uh, this is a noisy uh, input data. This has been attacked. Now there is a very interesting uh, uh, thing. Uh, okay, so this X is not attacked. So let me correct myself. This X is not attacked. Okay, so this is a clean X. Now the, there's an interesting assumption about the X which says that X has to come from a generator. Now, what does it mean? Well, let me give you an X. I assume that something behind the X is happening. There is a generated function G that takes something called Z and is going to give you an X. So how are you going to imagine that? So imagine that Z is a vector of IID Gaussian entries. You send this z vector through some kind of uh, neural network, or generally we call them the generative uh, models. And then what is being generated would be another vector that may or may not have the same dimension of your z. Okay, so here is your z. You have a generator, and then that will give you an x. Now, for those of you who have some experience in deep neural network, you probably realize that this is called the generative adversarial network. In a generative adversarial network, or GAN in short, uh, you will also have a discriminator that trying to discriminate the output generated by this G. In our problem, we do not have the discriminator. We are only studying the generator. So what this equation says is that if I give you an x, I am going to assume that there is an underlying generator G that takes an IID Gaussian vector and I will go and I'm going to give you a input data x. So when you have this function defined, then your x is no longer an arbitrary signal. Your x has to be confined to the, the function g, which generates x. Now, I'm also going to define a perturbation r. Uh, this is the attack that you are going to add onto the x. Here, f is your classifier. And so you are going to apply your classifier f on either x or some perturbed version of X. And so according to the paper by Fossey et al., they are defining a function called the in-distribution robustness. This in-distribution robustness is defined as the optimum value of an optimization problem. 
Now, what is the optimization problem? The optimization problem certainly contains an objective function and also a constraint. The objective function says that I have an observation x, and then I also have a generator g that is applied to z plus r. So notice one very interesting thing is that this is actually very, very similar to what we call the minimum distance attack. If you recall in the minimum distance attack, we're trying to minimize the perturbation amounts subject to the constraint that you will be misclassified. Here, what you are asking is that I am not distorting your signal in the input space X. However, I'm distorting your signal in the latent space, which is Z. So in other words, if you go to this diagram, I'm going to perturb your Z here, so that when you send this Z plus R through the G, I'm going to give you something that is no longer X. It will become something else, let me call it X tilde. And therefore, this objective function says that I'm going to find an R that can minimize this distance. The distance is still measured in the space of the input. This is where you measure the distance. However, the perturbation is launched in the latent space. Now, I do want to do this uh, perturbation in the latent space because I want to prove some results using the gener generative model. There is a constraint here. The constraint is also very interpretable. It says that once you perturb the data z to up, z plus r, and you apply a generator g, and certainly that that is going to give you something uh, like x tilde. And so now, if you apply f to x tilde, uh, you want it to be different from if you apply f to x. So this would define the constraint. You want the data to be misclassified. On the other hand, you also want the perturbation amount to be minimized in the input space. And if you can solve this optimization problem, then the minimum value, not the minimizer, which is the R, the minimum value of this objective function is defined as the in-distribution robustness. Now, why is it called the robustness? It is called the robustness because the bigger this gap is, then the bigger margin you will have from your data point to the classifier's uh, decision boundary. It's called the in-distribution uh, robustness uh, because you're really assuming that uh, there is a generator G. So here is a slide summarizing what we have talked before. Uh, if you are interested in, you can replace the x by g of z and g of z here. Then you can see a parallel uh, argument for both your attack data point and your input data point. So here the constraint says that the perturbed data point is classified different from the original. And then this objective function says that for those that causes misclassification, I want to minimize the perturbation strength. The smallest perturbation that still causes misclassification is then defined as the robustness of f. And of certainly, you want our in of x to be as large as possible so that you can have a big margin. Now, there is another term that was defined in the paper. It's called the unconstrained robustness. Let us look at this definition here. The definition is actually quite similar to the in-distribution robustness. However, there is no longer this funny thing called the generator G. In the objective function of the unconstrained robustness, the objective function is just the norm of your perturbation R. And the, con the constraint is simply the perturbation in the input space. And so this is a more general form than the previous slide. 
in the sense that there is no longer this generator that is happening in the equation. And clearly, we do want to study this thing called the unconstrained robustness. So what you can show is that this unconstrained robustness is upper bounded by the in-distribution robustness. Now, why is that true? Because here you have a larger degree of freedom of playing around your X and your R. Your X is no longer limited to the output of a generator, and therefore you will be able to have a bigger set of R that can minimize the perturbation strength. Uh, and therefore, in principle, you should be able to find a solution that will give you a lower objective value. And therefore, you can always show that the unconstrained robustness has to be lower than or equal to the in-distribution robustness. Now, in addition, if we can also prove that this in-distribution robustness is less than something, and if that something is universal for any classifier, and this something has some kind of a probability going to 0 or 1, then we will be able to claim something useful. Now, for certain specific classifier, you can also show that half of the in-distribution uh, error it, uh, robustness is upper bound by the unconstrained robustness. If you are interested in this theorem, you can read theorem 2 of Fawcett's paper. So what we are going to do, and what Fawcett did in, in theorem 1 of their paper, is that they are going to show a bound on the in-distribution robustness. If they can find this eta, then they will be able to also bound the unconstrained robustness, which is the robustness that we are interested in studying. Let me give you the main results, and then in the next slide, I'm going to give you some interpretation of this main result. As I said in the beginning of this lecture, we are not going to talk about the proof of this theorem because the proof of this theorem requires you to use some advanced probability tools, for example, the Gaussian isoperimetric inequality. Now, in addition, I'm not going to give you the full form of the theorem given by Fawcy at all. I am going to give you a very, very specific case of this theorem so that we can draw some uh, equations to understand what's going on. So the theorem says this in a very specific form, that if you have a classifier f which takes a d-dimensional vector and send it to one of the k classes, this is a, an arbitrary classification function, then for any eta, you're measuring the probability of this event. Okay, now this is exactly what we want. We want to upper bound the in-distribution robustness by some eta. And this result says that the probability for this event to happen is at least 1 minus something. And on the, on the right-hand side of this something, there is a thing called the, the L, and L is the Lipschitz constant of the generator G. Now, what is Lipschitz constant? The Lipschitz constant is really the, the maximum slope of a function. If you're interested in looking at the details of the Lipschitz constant, you can read the Wikipedia page on this topic. So how do we interpret this results? Well, this result, you can also say that uh, this is uh, a number delta. And so uh, with probability uh, at, at least uh, 1 minus a delta, uh, I will have this R e of x uh, to be less than Ada. Okay, so uh, with probability 1 minus delta, hopefully this delta is a very small number. With, with probability 1 minus delta, then this event will hold. If I can find this event, then certainly according to the previous slide, I'm, I will be able 
to upper bound my ink distribution robustness. So instead of proving the results, let us take a look at this quantity on the right hand side and see if it's, it's giving us some idea of what's going on in this robustness business. Let us look at this equation. The event that you're measuring is the in distribution robustness to be less than or equals to eta. So what this means is that you want the robustness to be no better than eta. Now remember that RE is the in distribution robustness. The bigger the RE, the bigger the margin you will have between data point and also the classifiers separating hyperplane. And so if you want to put an upper bound ADA on RE, then essentially you are saying that your robustness is no better than ADA. And certainly this is a bad event. And for bad event, you want this to be small. However, when you look at this equation, the equation says that the probability of this event is indeed bigger than one minus something. And hopefully this something is small. If this is small, then the probability of having this bad event is quite likely. Now, let us look at this quantity here. This is e to the power minus eta squared divided by 2l squared. As I mentioned, l is the Lipschitz constant of your generator function. And so normally what you can see is that L is much, much less than the dimensionality of your data point. Or in other words, your L is typically not a very big number. And therefore, as long as you can launch a perturbation of magnitude, Ada that is proportional to L, then you have a high chance of fooling the classifier. For example, if you set Ada to be 2L, then you can show that the probability of having this bad event is at least 0 0.8. And so now what is the meaning of this Ada? Well, the Ada certainly is an upper bound on the robustness. But if you recall the definition of the, of the in distribution robustness, that in distribution robustness is the minimum perturbation distance from the point to the plane. And therefore, the bigger the eta is, that means your perturbation strength is increasing. And so if you set the perturbation strength eta to be just as small as 2L, then you can show that the probability of, of making sure that this to happen is at least 0 0.8. And this is almost very, very likely to happen. And so for just two L perturbation magnitude, you will have 0.8 probability of fooling the classifier. And therefore, and therefore uh, with, with a very small perturbation for any classifier, because this equation is independent of a specific classifier. All we need to know is the Lipschitz constant that is about the data point that has nothing to do with your classifier. That only says that your training data sets contains data points X that can be generated from a generator. You can replace the classifier by something else. That generator is not going to change. And therefore this result is universal to all classifiers. The only drawback of this theorem is that you need to assume the existence of a generator. But if you accept this fact, then, then this result is, is universal. And it says that with pretty high probability, even with a small perturbation, uh, that you will be able to, to fool a classifier. So this is the main result of Fossey's paper which suggests that with a small perturbation, you will be able to fool any classifier with high probability. Now, at this point, you may also wonder, what if my, my, my data has a dimension D that is growing? 
Now, why do I want to ask this question? Because I just say that normally L is much, much less than D, and therefore you will have this in distribution robustness uh, to be less than eta. But what if my D, I want to look at the result as a function of D, uh, as the ambient dimension grows, will I also have adversarial attack? So let us quickly look at this paper by, by Shafahi. Uh, what they showed is that with probability at least uh, this number, uh, then one of the following results will hold. The first result is that the data X is originally misclassified. And the other result is that X can be attacked within any epsilon ball, where this epsilon ball uh, matches the epsilon that they have in their probability. Now, this V stands for the volume of certain certain sphere, which we can ignore that. Uh, however, uh, by just looking at this probability, you realize that uh, as the dimension grows, as D grows, uh, this number will go to a zero very, very quickly. Now, how do you see that? Uh, as D grows, this exponential function will go to zero, and therefore, this number will go to zero, and hence, this entire probability will go to one very quickly. And so as the dimensionality of D grows, the probability will go to one. And therefore, for large images, the probability of attacking is pretty high. Now, how, why? Well, the, because this theorem says that with probability, at least this really, really big number, that either your data point is originally misclassified, meaning that you don't have to do anything, or uh, your X can be attacked within an epsilon ball. And therefore, your, your classifier is vulnerable within this epsilon ball. So this is the two main results that we have seen uh, in the two papers, one by Fonsi, one by Shafahi. Uh, so what they have claimed is that uh, for any classifier, as long as your as long as your attack strength is not too small, and as the ambient dimension of your data point grows, in uh, or as your uh, the the Lipschitz constants uh, uh, grows, then then there is almost certainly that you can attack the classifier. Now these results they are giving you the existence results, uh, meaning that. Uh, you can always show that there exists a, a attack mechanism that can fool your classifier. What is not shown is that how are you going to attack, and this is not the focus of this uh, these two papers. So what is the takeaway message of, uh, of these two papers is that uh, even though your perturbation per pixel is small, the sum of all these small perturbations can be big. Now, you may also ask, can a random noise attack a classifier? And it turns out that a random noise is almost impossible to attack a classifier, especially in a white box setting. Uh, the probability of getting a correct attack direction is close to zero in high dimensional space. Now, if you're interested in this discussion, you can read the lecture notes on part three. Uh, and there is a discussion of how are you going to show that IID Gaussian noise is very difficult to attack a classifier in high dimensional space? Okay, so we have finished the discussion of the first question of are we able to uh, uh, provide adversarial robustness for any classifier? And the conclusion is no, uh, all classifiers, they are vulnerable to adversarial attacks. Now, if this is indeed the case, then can we ask, uh, is there any trade-off between robustness and accuracy that we can explore so that we can find the optimum operating point for my classifier? So when we come back in the second half of this lecture, we're going to talk about this robustness-accuracy trade-off.